How's it going there, Apes? Welcome to another AP Environmental Science Lecture. Today we're going to look at what we're doing with our municipal solid waste in regards to landfills and incineration. So this didn't essentially begin until the 1930s when the public started to oppose these open dumps that were growing as the populations and as cities grow, grew. Um, and the most convenient locations for disposable of waste became holes in the ground created by the removal of sand or earth or any of those materials and was then used for construction purposes. So when people filled those holes with waste, the sites became known as landfills. The open dumps are now rare in developed countries. They still exist in the developing world where they pose a considerable, considerable health hazard. So what we're gonna look at today, we're gonna look at a couple of things. We're gonna describe the goals and functions of the solid waste landfill, and then we're gonna see another option that may come up or that some cities may choose to do, and that's in regards to incinerating or burning the waste. So well, before we get moving, we already understand, we've seen this before, that a third of our waste is going to be recovered by re reuse and recycling. That's a good thing. And more than half is just discarded. So that remainder converted into energy through incineration. So that's where that 12% is coming in. So looking at that, we have to determine what we can do with this 54% of, in this case, we're going to use the word useless material. So before we get moving, let's look at some landfill basics. And before we do that, we're going to look at Professor William Rothche. He was a, unfortunately, he passed away in 2012, but you can see this book here, Rubbish. He started this, I guess you'd call movement or what they called garbology. He was actually an archaeologist, um, you know, studying past civilizations. And what he did is he brought those tools and ideas from archaeology and brought them into modern day garbage. So, um, you know, he would go to actual landfills and they would dig up and what they would notice is like, they would be able to pull out newspapers that are over 40 years old, you know, sitting in a landfill for 40 plus years and they'd still be able to read the headlines. And so what he, this person did, what Professor Rothschild did was, he got rid of a lot of the misconceptions that once, um, garbage goes into landfill it will decompose and eventually go away so it doesn't decompose and today it's widely accepted that decomposition takes place only in those areas of a landfill where there's a correct mixture of air moisture and organic material and because most areas don't contain that necessary mixture a landfill is probably going to remain the same size as it was when it started to when it's capped so a few things we need to look at the first thing is a leachate and we've heard leaching before when we talked about groundwater. So all that's happening is here is, you know, liquid is going to slowly percolate through the waste that's been put in this giant hole. And as it goes through, it picks up these pollutants, especially remember we talked about maybe if you're throwing away e-waste, your old computer or old cell phones, it, it gets collected as the water goes through the garbage and it can contaminate our soil and even local groundwater or streams. So the goal is to have this sanitary landfill. I know it sounds kind of like an oxymoron. How do you have something sanitary when it's just filled with garbage? But that is the whole goal of the facility. It's just this hole in the ground, and it's got to contain that waste. And if you notice, it's designed to have limited impact. I mean, here you have every person's waste in an area. Is there going to be some sort of environmental impact? Of course. But again, the goal is to limit our, the, the amount of environmental impact. So what certain companies will do is again these are terms that you should be familiar with is a tipping fee so when you see tip just think the garbage truck here has to tip its bed um, and it's a charge so right now it's usually about fifty dollars a ton which may not seem a lot to you and i but again imagine every single day your garbage collection is going is happening in a different neighborhood so that's a lot of garbage and the whole goal of this tipping fee is to reduce the amount of waste and be able to separate recyclables. If I can pull a certain amount of waste out of my trash, um, you're not getting charged as much. So you'll see maybe it's waste management in your local community where they've also offered you a bin to recycle because they, that eliminates them taking that out and getting charged for that extra weight. The other thing that must be taken into consideration is choosing a site for a landfill. So the goal is that soil that is very rich in clay. Remember when we talked about soil 
in this components of soil, clay does not allow water to penetrate through. So if you can dig a giant landfill and that the bottom of the landfill has clay, that's going to reduce the migration of contaminants into waterways. Um, and also, hopefully, your landfill is away from a waterway. You know, you could have a period of heavy rain where that rain floods over from the way from the landfill into waterways like streams and lakes. And then, of course, we want them away from population centers. You, no one wants to live near their, where their um, garbage is going because of the accumulation of smell, um, seagulls, rats, things that forage. So these need to be far away from a city. And something that gets brought up is when they choose where they want to put a landfill, the abbreviation may have seen it before is N-I-M-B-Y, but the whole goal is not in my backyard. So just like you know, we have the conveniences once a week. We can take all the trash we accumulated that week, put it on our curb. We come home from school or work, and that trash is magically gone. It is no longer in our backyard. This gets very interesting when there's people with financial and political influence are going to affect where landfill sites are. So what we see a trend in is um, landfills show up in places not necessarily where they're in a spot where there is clay in the soil or they're away from population centers, but they're away from the people with the money or the political influence. A perfect example is in Fort Wayne, Indiana. You had the Adams Center landfill. It's now closed. It closed in 1997. But here you had an area, um, and what they found out is if 1 to 10, with 10 being I, the best site for a landfill, this area um, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, would rate it a possible 3, maybe a 4, because of the site held a substantial risk of water contamination. But if you looked at the community that lived here, it was the low socioeconomic uh, demographic, people with not a lot of money, people not with a lot of political influence. So sure enough, that's where the landfill ended up. So um, the goal is that a perfect in a perfect world, it would be away from all these situations. But again, we always, money and politics always gets involved. And as you may know, I'm sure you can assume by now that there are environmental consequences to certain landfills. And there's that leachate again. So again, you want that clay as the bottom of your um, landfill. They'll also put some tarps down to prevent water from seeping through. If it does go through, then it hits the clay. But again, it, do, it will contaminate those underlying waterways. Um, another thing we look at is that decomposition. And remember this decomposition, especially methane, um, coming from those bio ways, so rotting food from your kitchen, restaurants, markets. And that can be an explosion hazard. So you'll, if you've ever been to a landfill, you'll also see pipes where uh, methane is leaking out. Usually they're lit, they're burning off. Or if they're not lit, they collect that methane and you, they do create electricity or heat. So this, moving on here, if we don't have a landfill, if we do have a landfill, one option is to take that garbage one, to save space and, into, and incinerate it. So incineration is interesting. Um, like I just mentioned, you're reducing the amount of volume, so you're getting rid of that space because you can imagine in a landfill, remember we talked at the beginning of the chapter, those things don't decompose. A landfill is just there to hold it, and when it's filled, they cap it and move on. So by incinerating, yes, we're reducing the volume and the mass. We can get heat from that. And then again, it is efficient. It will reduce that weight. It will reduce that volume. But as you can see here in the picture, this is a, an incineration plant outside Detroit. You can just imagine the amount of air pollution this pollutes or this causes. And as with anything you burn, you do have byproducts. In this case, we have ash. And there's two types of ash you should be familiar with. Um, the bottom ash, exactly what it sounds like. So as you know, here we have our garbage truck. Here's all of our garbage. The crane dumps it in, it burns it. Some will go off as fumes and steam, and then you have your ash. So the bottom ash will just be collected and disposed at another place, maybe a landfill. If it is full of toxic waste, like maybe for metals, they'll have to um, put it, take it to a more um, secure location. And then that fly ash thing, that's the ash that flies away. That's collected in a furnace, and the same deal, it will go off if it doesn't end up on the um, bottom or the, yeah, the bottom ash, it'll go off into our, our atmosphere and the air we breathe. So as I just mentioned, what they're going to do is we can take it to a landfill 
And again, they're always checking. So before this ash just gets put into that dump truck, they're seeing how much lead, cadmium, and heavy metals are in it because they're not going to put it in a landfill. Again, going back to that risk of polluting water. It can be used for road construction. Um, mixed with the asphalt and then even cement ingredients. And as I mentioned there, it goes to the toxic. If it is toxic, it'll, they'll have to do a little more care with the waste as is. And we've kind of hinted at it as well. When you do burn something, you do create energy. So this incineration of the getting that heat energy can be used to create electricity, fuel, gas, but then always remember when you do burn something, just as we learned in air pollution, it will go off into the atmosphere. Um, looking now at the environmental consequences with incinerators. So you, they do charge a little more because you do need energy. It, yes, these materials will burn, but sometimes you'll need coal or natural gas to get the fire really going. So that's why it's a little more expensive. We already talked about those air pollutants. Um, and then again, that ash becomes a, um, concentrated with those toxins. And the other thing that um, is quite interesting is, again, trash collection is a business. And if you own a business, your goal at the end of the day is to make money. Um, you need a large amounts of this municipal solid waste because, you know, if you're burning it, you're creating energy. But then all of a sudden, what starts happening to your fuel supply if there's not a lot of people or trash being collected? So there is a cost benefit to incinerators as well, is if they're not going to make money, they're not going to incinerate it. It'll just sit in that landfill. And to wrap up here, here's your kind of pros and cons. You know, everything has its good and its bad. Um, and what to do with our garbage is, one, it depends on where in the country um, the land, the garbage is being collected, what's in the garbage, and so on. So just familiar yourself with these pros and cons of landfill and incineration. And that wraps it up. So if you have any questions, always come see me, shoot me an email, or check the website. See ya!